Maybe it's maybe it's a me thing that I should really be worried about. I had like literally fifteen. I was like failures, and I just like immediately wrote this giant list. <laughs> and then I was like, "Oh, to Mallory's only going to bring a couple. I got to like pare it down. This is not like an hour long keynote." Hit it. That's what I'm talking about. Wait. Okay, now from the beginning. Hit it, boys. Welcome to Higher Ed Pulse, your Monday morning energizer covering insights and trends in higher ed marketing and enrollment. I'm Mallory Wilsey, bringing over 15 years of ed tech and marketing expertise to your earbuds. And I'm Seth O'Dell, joining the Pulse with my own adventures from leading marketing at top universities to founding Canahoma, one of the industry's fastest growing digital marketing agencies. Each week, we bring you the kind of insider insights you typically only find over cocktails with your pals at a conference. It's fast, it's fun, and it's designed for you, the busy higher ed professional. You're not just listening to another podcast. You're checking the pulse of higher education. Higher Ed Pulse is part of the Enrollify Network, a robust collection of podcasts designed to help higher ed professionals like you grow. Explore our other shows at Enrollify.org. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the next generation AI student engagement platform, helping institutions create meaningful and personalized interactions with students. Learn more at element451.com. All right, welcome back to the Higher Ed Pulse. That's right, it's an opening from Seth. We're shaking up a little bit. Mallory, how are you doing? I'm doing great, thanks. How are you, Seth? I'm good, this is new territory for me. But I wanted to open because I was gonna tell you, I just started a new project this week. I am on a journey to fold 1,000 paper cranes, like origami paper cranes. It's a Japanese tradition um, that if you fold 1,000 paper cranes, uh, it can symbolize hope and healing, uh, either for others or yourself. And so I have decided to go on a journey to fold 1,000 origami paper cranes, and while doing each one, to spend the time reflecting on meaning and purpose in my life and just use the time to build a little bit of a deeper relationship with myself. And so that is my my gift to the world, and a gift to myself is that accountability. And the gift to the world is the story that if you're looking for something to do and you got a little bit of time, I'm told it takes most people a year or more, some people just a few months, but I have just started this week folding 1,000 paper cranes. I feel like I have 1,000 follow-up questions. I will limit it. <laughs> I will limit it to two. (laughs) Okay, sounds good. How long does it take to fold a single paper crane? So it's really not fair to judge. I'm very new to this, Mallory. So I'm still like following tutorials. And so I think I will answer that in in the next couple of weeks. I think once I get maybe my first dozen or more under the belt, then I'll know. I'm also avoiding your question because I'm terrified to tell you it takes forever. (laughs) So like, I'm hoping I can get a little faster, but I'm not at a place where I've like memorized the process just yet. Okay. I am curious and I'd love to get the data on when you start to like find the efficiency in this. Like, is it, is it crane 58? Yeah. Is it crane 272? Well, I'm tracking how many I'm doing. So I'll find, I will be able to find that out. Is your second question, what am I doing with all these cranes? I mean, that's the question that Lauren, my wife has been asking me as well. And so jury's out i haven't figured that out yet can i offer an idea (laughs) yeah please um you always send the most beautiful christmas packages holiday packages to your network to your customers and i don't know if you send more than a thousand of them or not but we don't so that would work we sent like 300 last year of our coffee roasters gifts so maybe uh Maybe a little origami should be joining that. That's a great suggestion. I would love to get one of your origami cranes. I would put it on my desk. I would look at it every day. I would think of you. Oh, I love that. Then that gives you like, right, like to talk about smart goals, right? You need T, the time bound is like a key thing for a smart goal. Now you have something that's time bound to get at least 300 of them out the door before you send those holiday packages. I can do that. I like it. I like it. You know what? We're in the moment. I'm signing up for it. I mean, love it. He's locked in and we were going to all hold you to this one, Seth. And I can't wait in a future episode where I'm going to hold up that crane and say, I find like, <laughs> so you better make sure you put one in mine, even if you don't send it to anybody else. Yes. I love it. Well, I'm doing it to self-reflect and I feel like self-reflection in a lot of ways is today's topic. So for folks listening, we have decided to tackle a topic called failing forward flubs from our past. 
Uh, I think we spend a lot of time each week talking about wins, whether they're ours or yours as listeners. We shout people out in the industry all the time. But we always talk about people doing things great, succeeding, putting up numbers. I think it's worth also acknowledging that like, you can't get to any place of prominence without stumbling a lot along the way. And we've both had a fair amount of flubs in our past. And so we challenged each other to like think of a few failures of our own past that we may share in some cases for the first time ever publicly. Some may have been shared, some may not. And so uh, I don't know if you're ready, Mario. I have four. I don't know if I need to share all four, but I'm ready when you are. And I, I'm just ready to do some storytelling with each other. And I'd love to hear some of your failures and maybe share a few of mine. You can tell that we're definitely different Enneagram numbers because as a three, I'm like, oh, I'm only bringing one to this conversation. <laughs> I had to pare down. Maybe it's maybe it's a me thing that I should really be worried about. I had like literally 15. I was like, failures. And I just like immediately wrote this giant list. And then I was like, oh, no, Mallory's only going to bring a couple. I got to like pare it down. This is not like an hour long keynote. Like I literally had so many to choose from. I'm signing you up right now for the Engage Summit next summer where you can actually dive into all 15. So I look forward to that conference presentation. Love it. Even more. 60 failures in 60 minutes. That's going to be the the new time. Let's go. And so like, I assume, Seth, when you challenged me to this, I assume that you don't want me to talk about things like, oh, I posted to the wrong social media account, but it wasn't controversial. No, yeah. Or like, you know, oh, I sent out an email with the wrong link in it to 35 people. Like, I'm assuming you're not, you're not looking for those kind of things. No, not so much. Not so much. I mean, like, I think those are fine, but I think, you know, good stubs of the toe that hurt for, for a couple of weeks afterwards, kind of that is a little bit more of the types of failures we're looking for. You know what? I, I, this is totally me stalling because, again, I'm a three and I'm like, we don't admit our failures. Uh, so let me stall for a little bit more. I actually ask this question in interviews. So I, I ask people what their biggest mess up is. Then when they say to me, oh, I sent out the wrong email and it had the wrong date and time. I was like, not good enough. Keep trying. Like I keep poking at this one until they actually admit to like, something crazy. And the reason I ask it is not because I care about the mistake. I care about the learning on the other side. And I think that's really the point of this episode, right? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. All right. So since I brought extras and since you're stalling, are you okay if I go first? I'll lead with the first one. Yeah, please do. (laughs) Thanks for picking up on that. Okay. So so this first failure, I would say is, you know, I'm going to try to not name names, but one of my recent employers, I was managing a large marketing spend in the millions and millions of dollars. And we were looking to increase performance. And for folks that work in the adult or online space, you know that obviously September is big seasonality for demand, but January is also very big. Um, you know, New Year's resolutions, things like that. And a lesson that I had learned at Southern New Hampshire University back during my time there was that January seasonality actually starts at Christmas. And so even though December is historically known as like a low demand month for adult and online programs because people are caught up with family and the holidays, the truth is that as soon as they people go home and they're around their friends and family, they're having conversations about what are you up to? What are you thinking? And so there's a lot of increased search demand really starting like right at Christmas all the way through New Year's. And so a lesson I've learned is you want to actually spend a lot of money the last week of December. So December is usually a low spend month. It's like, no, no, no. Spend a lot of money the last week of December and catch all those people because people are really thinking about what I want to do next year. It's not like none of us show up January 1st and then think of the New Year's resolution, right? So I was at this employer and I said, yeah, I'm going to spend a lot of money. So I put like hundreds of thousands of dollars pulled forward into December put it out there in the market, spent on crushed, captured so much demand and never checked with enrollment to see if they were working between Christmas and New Year's. And so like they were working, but like skeleton crew, total skeleton crew flooded them with leads. They literally couldn't call the leads. And so, you know, you have an issue in, in marketing and enrollment where you call a thing called last in first out, which means you call the most recent lead because it's the freshest. But that means that if you can't every day get to all the leads, all of a sudden it becomes this huge growing pool of people that never, ever hear from you. And so I just like flushed so much money because I never coordinated with enrollment to make sure we had the staffing level to work the leads I drove. And so it like proved that the marketing demand was there, but I had to wait a whole year, a whole year I had to wait, Mallory, just to correct myself and actually have the staffing levels correct to meet the lead demand that we were successfully capturing. And that was a lot of egg on my face to tell everybody because I everyone's like, how'd that go? And I was like, it went really good for a little while and then went really bad after that. And they're like, why? Is it because I didn't think to tell anyone what I was doing? So that would be one of my one of my bigger ones that still stings. I'm trying to laugh quietly over 
<laughs> Thanks. I appreciate the quiet laughter. That's real humble. Every that's a real supportive friend there. I laugh at you, but I laugh quietly. <laughs> Seth, something tells me that you have over communicated now whenever you're Big time, done. Ever since. No question. Always. That I I am a big believer in move fast and make mistakes, but never make the same mistake twice. And I, I literally told my team that last week. Uh, and so then I always tell everybody. And so, yeah, big time. So that's one of my, but, but you got to meet me halfway, Mallory. I shared, you got to share. So yeah, let's, what do you got? Okay, for the record, I did bring more than one to this conversation. <laughs> I'm going to baby step my way into this. Actually, my I think my biggest flubs, at least, and maybe this is recency bias, but like my examples are very enrollify focused. <laughs> so I'm about to like, you know, uncover some of the stuff that I've messed up on just in the last nine months since taking on the enrollify network. So here we are. The first is actually around our launch party at AMA last year. So I know we have a lot of listeners who were there and were enjoying their Enrolleritas and their French 451s. We put some sparkly glitter in the drinks. It was so much fun. I think I personally have five of those margaritas. They were delicious. And then they handed me the check. Seth, I am usually so good at saying to the bar during an event like this, when it's an open bar in the hotel lobby where we've literally invited the entire conference to come and drink on our tab, I never forget. I made the biggest boo-boo. I didn't put a limit on it. I didn't say to the bar, when we hit this number, come find me to make sure we can keep going type of a thing. Yeah. That just never crossed my mind. I am not going to tell you what the five-digit number was. I've been to AMA. I know damage can be done. Yeah, uh, so that is uh, not totally surprising. So it was the largest turnout at AMA ever. We are in Chicago, primarily drinking mixed drinks at this bar. You can you can make your own assumptions to where this multi-hour open bar netted out. But they handed that check to me. I looked down. I was like, um, my credit card spending limit is a third of this <laughs> So I turned around and poor artist, I just turned around and handed it to him with like a, you know, like a kind of look on my face, like, I'm sorry. But also, the event was the talk of the conference. And boy, did we ever launch this Enrollify thing in like the biggest way, right? Like, I'm trying to put the positive spin on it. But I love it. That's a good one. That's great. I appreciate you sharing that. But you don't like, it's better to be successful and to have overspent. I had a boss tell me once, I don't care if I miss budget as long as I beat plan. And I was like, huh? He's like, because like, if you beat plan, everybody forgives. So it's like, if you racked up that tab and nobody showed kind of thing, he'd be like, what's going up? But it's like, you know, if, you, if the event kicks off and it over delivers, everyone's a little more forgiving. So I love that. That's a good one. So listeners, you could still help me out right now. Like maybe go subscribe. We're going to set up a GoFundMe. (laughs) Like, look, I got to show results. Okay. So like go to the website, give like, could you give us your email address? Like, I don't know. I'm still trying to prove ROI on that one and also set us up for this year's AMA, which is in Vegas for the record. So it's going to be even more expensive. That one's going to be wild. I've already booked my room and flight. I'm ready. Yes, I would like to host another party. So go subscribe to a couple more podcasts, like triple your listening for the next couple months and we'll get there. (laughs) Yes, I love it. That's so good. Okay. All right, Seth, what's your next one? Okay, so my first one was about under communicating. My second one is about over communicating. It was my first like real career lessons early on when I worked at UCLA. I got invited to be part of this committee that was about like updating the campus tour videos on the website. And basically there was like eight people in a room and they were just sort of like, what one or two videos should we add to this like campus tour platform that we have? And I showed up and I had built a whole new platform for campus tours using YouTube and like the YouTube engagement stuff where you could click between videos and everything. And I had gone out and shot all these demo and I just like took over the meeting and put on this presentation. I was like, we could do all this stuff. We do all and like, 
literally one, they just was crickets and then they moved on. And then two, then they kicked me off the committee and they didn't tell me and they ghosted me. And I just was like, what happened to that project? They're like, oh, we're still meeting. You're just not invited back. And it was like, because like, and the lesson for me was like obvious, which is like, you know, Stephen Covey says, seek first to understand, then to be understood. I didn't show up and listen to anything. I just like showed up and like grabbed the mic and like went to town telling everybody my random big idea. And like, it was a neat idea, but I didn't even understand what the demands on the business were. And so that was a big failure. That stung because there was a lot of people that saw it and heard about it. So it was definitely on the embarrassing side, but I got a good enough lesson out of it. I think it served me over the long run to have stubbed my toe with that one. Oof. I feel the pain in my toe. (laughs) I've done that before. Yeah. Right? It's it's the ghost thing. Okay. This is clever too. I found out I got ghosted because I walked by the next meeting and I'm like, hey, what's what's ever doing in there? Like, that's the meeting they're having without you. You yokel, like, what are you doing? Like, they, that's because you went crazy in the last meeting and they kicked you out. You know, I, see, I just see passion, Seth. Like, I see and hear passion out of this story. Like, I, you, I've been the culprit of steamrolling far too many meetings in my career, too. But it's because I'm passionate about the topic. <laughs> yeah, it's 100%. So that's my second one. But I don't know. Like, what, what's, what else you got? All right, another Enrollify one. This just happened in June. (laughs) So we relaunched the Enrollify website. When you run a network with 15 active podcasts and you have hundreds, if not more than a thousand links to past podcast episodes that are out there on social media, in emails, in downloadable white papers, etc., you kind of need to get the redirects, right? My lesson learned is to not always take things that people tell you at face value because sometimes they're not telling you the right thing. And Mm. like I totally had a, you know, slip and fall moment when we pushed, you know, the new site live despite the assurances I was given that these redirects were in place. Yeah. They weren't. And it's sadly like not just impacted me, it's like created other work for other people on the team and like Ooh, I'm still feeling the pain of this one. Uh, that is so tough. I think, you know, there's always the classic leadership phrase of like inspect what you expect. And I've got a lot of examples like that in myself in the past where it's like you think something's being done. Uh, you either were told it or you assume it or there's a miscommunication. And then it's like, b- but you didn't look and you didn't confirm and then it bites you. So that's a tough one. You were so close to getting out of it. The new site looks great. And like, you know, I think the reality is a lot of people have similar stories, even if we don't share them about like, yeah, it looks great publicly, but behind the scenes, you know, it took a lot to get there. So I empathize with that one for sure. Mm. My lesson learned is to ask more questions and to ask them a lot sooner. Yeah, I love that. That's good. That's good. So listen, for the sake of time, I'm going to do one more and I'm going to keep it a little brief. I had one that used to be one of my biggest successes and now I think it's one of my biggest failures. At a previous job, I redesigned an entire .edu website and I didn't tell the president or faculty it was happening. And I launched it without telling anyone. And then I ducked everybody for four days while they were all freaking out. And so by the time I finally sat down with them, I was able to show them that we increased conversion by over 100%. And that if they wanted me to revert anything, that was fine, but that I was going to document all the negative impact it would have on revenue. And it like scared everybody to not do anything. And like it was my way of like taking over the website. And like we drove a ton more revenue, like millions more dollars in revenue. But like in the process, like so I, at the time, I thought, what a win, right? What a sneaky way to build a website, not tell anybody it's coming and let performance data protect it. And from the website perspective, it was a huge win. But from like a overall like work relationship perspective and a Mac review is a huge failure. I like totally lost the forest for the trees and won the battle, but lost the war. And to me, the lesson is like, you know, if you want to do the right thing, you got to do the hard things the hard way. And that means sitting down and talking to committees and having conversations and putting together briefs and incorporating people's feedback and pushing back when it's wrong. And ha- like I just tried to like fast track and avoid all the hard conversations. And I only made things harder for myself in the long run. And I think it was really short sighted. And I think like if you make somebody feel disrespected, um, they're not going to respect you. And so it was just an example of me playing like a youthful game uh, without maturity, I think. And even though I put numbers on the board, Um, now at my more seasoned age and tenure in my career, I consider it a flub and a failure. Wow. That's so funny. I'm sorry. Just like, you're so (laughs) Oh my God. So 
stuff that's like, on the one hand, this flub is not a flub at all, because you've got the data that proves that you made the right choices. But it sounds like you just didn't go about it in the right way. And I think that's your takeaway. <laughs> totally. Exactly. That's my, my like the pure performance was a win. But like after the after the site launched, like people were frustrated with me. They didn't trust me as much. Like it was more nuanced. You know what I mean? And I think maybe that's the real lesson is that like success can still be subjective. That even though objectively the new site crushed, like subjectively, I made my life a lot harder after that. And I made it harder for my department and my team. And I like, you know, there's always a rift between marketing and everybody else in an organization. And mm -hmm. I made that gap wider. And I feel like that's never the appropriate thing to do. So that's, yeah, it's like a half win. I used to think it was a full win, but I just think now I'm like, you know what? The real win and the people I admire the most are the ones who can do the hard work the hard way, get those results while still bringing everybody along. Like it's hard enough to win, but if you win while leaving everybody behind, I don't know if that's quite the same level of success. Maybe that's the insight, if that makes sense. Yeah. I had a mentor once tell me that you should never walk into a meeting where you're expecting an important decision to be made without having socialized that decision with every stakeholder first, yes. already addressed their questions and concerns, so that when you walk into that meeting, it's, you know, it, it's more for show than anything else because everybody's already yes. had the tough conversations with you and you know what the outcome of that meeting is going to be. And so... um yeah. I totally agree. I've heard the same thing. I think that's spot on. That's great advice. All right. Well, Seth and I, it's been like therapy here, admitting yeah, all the things bit, right? that we've effed up on over our careers. Just a few. No, I have plenty more. I have so many more. <laughs> Come to next year's Engage Summit and you'll hear all yeah. about them, friends. We'll do a 24 hour live stream. I'll just go through the whole thing in a day. It'll be perfect. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm like, I actually feel it. Like my hands are getting clammy. Like, just thinking about this. <laughs> oh man well friends if uh, you've made it this far in the episode stick with me for one more second i gotta promote this amazing dei focus pulse check series one more time i know i talked about it a couple weeks ago but dr cody nielsen and dr tamika ferguson are running after further consideration right now and they're bringing these change leaders from campuses to talk about things like leadership and campus crises and sustainable change and, and they're doing it through a DEI lens. It's different than the other Pulse Check series that we've done before. And, you know, spoiler, like we're paying really close attention to the data on this one because I could see this being an entire podcast. There is so much to talk about with a DEI focus. And I, I just think there's a huge hole out there in in the podcast land around this. And so it really matters. If you are enjoying this Pulse series, we need to know because we're going to be making the decision soon about you know what the future of this topic is within Enrollify. And, and I just do continue to think that there's a space for it. So I've been really enjoying these episodes. Two have already dropped. The third one is on its way Thursday. I hope you'll give it a listen. All right, friends, we've made it. All right. It was a good one. <laughs> it is a good one. <laughs> Great seeing you, Mallory. Good conversation. Looking forward to chatting again soon. I can't wait to use all this for blackmail. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. All right, friends, we will see you soon. Have a great rest of your week. Bye, Seth. See you later.